What's up, Midway family? I am so excited for what God has for us tonight. I'm so excited to jump in God's Word with you and just to look at some things that I think we really could use. Not that, that we're not doing a good job here, but just a good refreshing reminder as Christians to, to do these things and to become attractive for God. See, we're gonna talk about something that we all think about. I don't care if you are in high school or if you are retired, you think about this in some way or some form, and that is attractiveness. It may not be physical anymore, and it may be physical, but in some way you want to be attractive, whether that's to your friend groups, to the girl you sit next to, or just to your spouse even. You still want to be attractive, even years into marriage. We all think about being attractive. And tonight, I want to talk about what it means to be an attractive church. How can we be the most attractive church? And how can we be an attractive church that God has called us to be? Tonight, we're going to be in Titus, and I hope that you have your Bibles. And I want to encourage you that after tonight, just go back and read this, this passage. Really meditate on what Paul is talking about here in Titus. Because these things are so impactful for our life. They're so crucial as a Christian. And if we're going to be a church that is on fire for the Lord, we need to do the things that this passage calls us to do. So we're going to be in Titus chapter 2 tonight, and I just want to give a, a short background of what, what is the book of Titus? What, where are we in the timeline? You know, who's writing this? What's going on? Well, like I said, Paul wrote this, and he's writing it to Titus. Now, Titus is one of Paul's disciples. He's like Timothy. He's a young man that Paul has trained up and has sent to be a pastor. And now Titus is pastoring this church, and Paul is writing a letter to him to help him instruct these people, these new believers, to be an attractive church for God, especially in this passage. That's what, what he's talking about. And so Paul writes to Titus about how the Christians were to act in order that the unbeliever would be attracted to church. Because ultimately, we can come every week and we can encourage each other, and that's great. But if we're not doing anything for the unbeliever in our, in our neighborhoods, in our society, in our world, then we're missing most of what God has called us to. And, and honestly, I would even venture as far to say is we're missing the point completely. So tonight, in, in chapter 2 of Titus, we're, we're just going to read a few verses and talk about it. It says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. The first thing that a church needs to be attractive is to have sound doctrine. Now, this just means that we have truth. We know the truth and we exercise the truth. Sound doctrine means that God's word is our authority. We are just coming out of these 40 days of prayer and these 40 days of getting into God's Word five more minutes every day to build this habit of being built on the authority of Scripture, being built on the authority of God's Word. So the first thing that Paul, Paul mentions here is that we are to be of sound doctrine. We're to know the truth and to stick to it. And that's going to prompt us to do all the things that he's going to talk about here later. The second thing we see is that an attractive church is about discipleship. Now, this is twofold. Discipleship isn't just one person doing all the work. No, it takes both older and younger people and people from different age groups and people from different generations to come together and say, we need to learn from each other. We need to be pushed on and prodded on to be an attractive church for God. So let's keep reading in verse 2. That the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be patient, to, to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that the one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. 
exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adore the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So this, this idea of discipleship, it takes some prerequisites. It takes us to do some things in our own personal life before we can actually do this. And one, we need to be Christians. We need to be believers in Christ. We need to be people who have put our faith and trust in Christ. And then from there, Paul lists out some things that men and women both need to have. He specifically calls these, these things out for men and women separately because these are things that each of those genders usually struggle with more. It's not, you know, permanent men only struggle with anger, women only struggle with purity. No, that's not how this works. But it's things that are often more to one side or the other, but it's something that we all can learn from each side. And so the first thing that we need is we need godly men and women who are willing to teach the next generation. We need the people who built Midway, the people who came in after it was built and helped make it to be what it is today. We need those people to come alongside people my age and in high school and bring us along, say, here is what Christ has done in my life, go and do likewise. But in order for you to do that, you need to be what, what, Titus, what it talks about here in Titus. The older men need to be sober and reverent and temperate, sound in faith and in love and patience. When, when us young guys mess up, be patient with us. Love on us. Show us that, yeah, we're not perfect, but you're going to help us be more like Christ. You're going to show us the wisdom that God has granted you through the years. And, and the older women are likewise to come alongside the younger women to help them to be pure, to not, not let their lips be loose, but, but to have self-control and to be obedient to the authorities that God has placed in their lives. And, and if the older generation does this, I know God is going to honor that. But also for my generation, what we need to do, or, or anyone who is going to be discipled at, at any age, we need to be humble. We need to be ready to learn. The people who want to disciple us and pour into us, they have wisdom from God. They have lived through things that we're going to live through and things that we couldn't even imagine. And it would be diligent of us to sit underneath their teaching and to apply that wisdom to our life. And so discipleship takes two. It takes one person who, has, who knows they don't have it all together. They know that they're not perfect, but God has taught them a lot of things. And it takes another person who is humble and teachable to come together and to make each other more like Christ. Discipleship is a lot more caught than taught. And, and what that just means is that as we are living our lives and we're looking for people who we can disciple, we're looking for people to bring alongside of us, we need to be mindful of the things that we're doing. We need to be running our life through that checklist in Titus. We need to be saying, am I kind? Am I obedient to the authority God has placed in my life? Do I pilfer at work or do I actually do what I'm called to do? And, and if we are not doing those things, those things need to change. Because the biggest turnoff to any unbeliever for the, for the gospel is an unauthentic faith, a hypocrite. And I know this is something that can be hard to hear because I know that I struggle in areas too. I have to be honest with myself that there is sin in my life that I'm constantly having to come to Christ and put to death so that I can go and disciple someone else, so that I can go and guide someone else. Our generation wants an authentic faith. And I talked about some of these things, but I just want to run through this list of some simplified ways to say what, what Titus says here. For ladies, be loving, be self-controlled. Like I said, don't let gossip be a part of your life. Be pure. Don't seek this confirmation based on outer looks, based on what you look like on the outside. Don't, don't let that be the center of your focus. Be hardworking and kind. Speak kind things over people. Be obedient to the authority God has placed in your life. Men, we're to be self-controlled. This is a hard one. This is something that I have had to struggle through in many different ways. But one way this can look like is anger. Sometimes it's easy as men, we get offended and we're like, we gotta fight. You know what I mean? It's time to, to throw some punches because they hurt my feelings. They hurt me. They said something about my family. 
But we're to be self-controlled. We're to model good works. We're to actually be doing the things that God has called us to do in His Word. We're to have good character. It's not just about what we do and everybody sees. It's also about what we do in our quiet time and with our personal lives. Are we watching things that are not godly? Are we reading and being involved in things that are not pure? Are we allowing the talk that comes out of our, our mouths when we're not around other Christians to not reflect Christ? And, and we're to speak the truth. Don't do anything that someone can turn against you for evil. That last sentence says that we are to do nothing that they could turn around and, and throw back in our face. Everything we do should be for Christ and for good. And the third thing, and honestly, this is what I'm talking about when I say the most important thing. This is what we build discipleship on. Without this aspect, there's no discipleship, there's no church. We just could come together and have a country club for, for all we care if we don't have this one aspect. And, and honestly, the most important aspect of an attractive church is that a, we are a church about the gospel. And I know this is something I'm passionate about, but it's something that I struggle with. It's hard for me sometimes to make those connections with people, to find unbelievers and say, hey, there's a God who created you and loved you. That's awkward. That's hard. Sometimes that may not be the best way to have that conversation, just to go up in a coffee shop and say, hey, I know God and He loves you and He made you. But, but we need to find creative ways to do that. Because in the next few verses, Paul is going to show us the reason that we can do anything, and that's Christ. So let's read in verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Paul brings it in. He reels in these attractive features and he makes it and he puts it into this package that's easy for us to deliver and easy for us to understand. See, all those things we talked about earlier are good. That is what God has called us to do. But ultimately, we need to know as Christians, we can't do any of those things without Christ. I cannot love my wife well and be kind to people who hurt me if I don't understand that Christ loves me well and Christ has been kind to me even though I put him on the cross. Christian, if, the, if what you need to do is pause this video right now and go read the gospel account, go read what Christ did for you, then do that. Because we need to be reminded of what Christ did for us. We need to be reminded that we didn't build Midway based on our own goodness. We didn't do anything for Christ based on ourselves. Everything that I've ever done, me going to Bible college, me seeing people you know, come to know Christ because I have shared the gospel with them, me getting up here to preach and to teach, none of that is possible if it wasn't for Christ. And we have to understand that. We have to live by that. That's part of being authentic, is saying, I've messed up, but Christ has redeemed me. And when we are a church about that gospel, when we are a church about that truth, we're going to see God do some amazing things in our midst. He's going to build up Midway for the next 50 years if we will keep that at the center of everything we do. See, the gospel is God's grace and salvation to us that we are able to live an attractive, loving, kind life for Him. As an attractive church, the gospel is the reason that we do anything. I heard this phrase, and I want to tell you, it's not my own, but it's so true. Church is not a huddle. Church is a hospital. This place right here, when people walk through those doors, this is a place for broken people to get healing. 
If we come every week and it's all about each other, it's all about our friends and seeing our friends that we haven't seen in a week, or, or we even sit under the teaching of Pastor Grant and the other pastors on staff here, and we just look at what can I gain from this, we're doing it wrong. I have to constantly go through my, my, my life and, and, and put my brain into this checklist of saying, am I doing this for myself? Do I teach and preach for my own glory? Do I come to, to service and say, okay, Pastor Grant, what can you feed me today? What, what is, uh, and then I leave when that message didn't impact me and I'm like, man, Pastor Grant, you didn't give me what I needed today. That's not how church works. God's word is all that we need. He's already given us everything we need. It's my duty to get into God's word and to feed myself, to, to be a person who is applying these things to my life. And the church's job is to share the gospel more and more, to make opportunities for people to share the gospel. Discipleship is the church's job. The church is to train us up so that we can go out and to share the gospel. It's all of us together, all of us working as one body. But we need to be about the gospel in order to accomplish that. And Paul reminds us here, he calls back to Christ time and time again in those last few verses because he wants these Christians and he wants us to know that in order to share the gospel, we need to know the gospel. It needs to have transformed our life first. And in Matthew, Jesus even commands us this. He gives us the final command that he's going to give on earth to his disciples. And he says in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Like I said, the work of salvation, the work of redemption in my life, it was Jesus. And the work of discipleship, the work of gospel sharing is also Jesus. Without him in either of those situations, I can't do it. I can't meet with guys and disciple them and bring them alongside me and say, hey, this is how I'm living my life if I'm not living my life because of Jesus. I'm honestly, I'm a dead man trying to, to make other dead men live, and I can't do that alone. If you've ever been to a morgue, you're not going to see the corpses get out of, out of their slots and go pick the other corpses up and say, hey, stand up and start walking, let's go. That's not going to happen because they're dead. Dead men can't help other dead men. And so church, we have to live by this. We have to live by what Christ has done for us. So as we bring all of these things together, these three things, we're to be an attractive church because of our sound doctrine. Having sound doctrine makes us attractive. Having discipleship makes us attractive. And being about the gospel makes us attractive. For who? Like I said at the beginning, Paul is writing this to this church so that they can be attractive to the outside world. Because the world around us, if we're being honest, they can find the things that they want. If they want a life of fame and fortune, there's ways to chase that. If they want a life of just doing some good things and helping the environment out and, and feeling good about themselves, they can do that. They figured all that out on their own. But what they haven't figured out is how to make them live. Now think about that for a moment. The world around us has figured out a lot of things. We're living in an age where we have a lot of amazing blessings because of people and smart people making things. But the only thing that we haven't figured out how to do is stop death. And not only to stop death, but to make the life that we have, the few years that we're on this earth, worth something in eternity. We haven't figured that out yet, but Christ figured it out. Christ had the plan from the beginning. He came to this earth. He lived the perfect life. He died the death that we deserved so that we could have a life of purpose. To be an attractive church is to be a church on purpose for Christ. 
I know I'm being preachy, I'm being passionate, but it's because this has prompted me to be where I'm at today. And it took some hard lessons for me. It took me being humble and saying, I need someone to pour into me so that I could learn these things. And there's days where I have to get out of bed and, the t and time is tough and, and things don't go my way, but I have to remind myself of who Christ is and what he's called me to. And some days I don't, I'm not perfect. I mess up. I go to bed angry. And I have to come back to Christ and ask for forgiveness. So tonight, as, as we wrap up, if you're a Christian and you can't say that your life looks like this, if you've been chasing the world and the world's desires, come back. It's so simple. You're not too far. The same God that saved you in the moment of your salvation is the same God who wants to bring you back in and for you to learn how to live this life for Him. Attractive life. Christian, if you are living on fire for God, you are doing these things, your life may not be perfect, but you can say that this is what your life looks like. Praise God. Bring someone alongside of you. Say, hey, I don't have it all figured out. I'll be honest with you. But what wisdom God has given me, I want to help give to others. And bring someone with you. And, and Christian, if you don't have someone who's discipling you, find that person. Come to them and say, I'm going to be humble and I'm going to be teachable. Would you show me how to live for Christ? Find someone to disciple you. And ultimately, every Christian, wherever you're at, your main priority is to reach a broken world, is to reach people with the gospel that saved you. Don't jump out of the way of the bus that's coming down the street full speed and not grab the guy beside you and pull him to the sidewalk too. That's selfish. That's the worst thing as, that we could ever do. And finally, if, if you are here and you're listening and you haven't made that decision, all these things I've been talking about, you don't understand because you, you've never had that experience with Christ. You didn't know there was a God who sent His only Son to die for you. Man, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening. And for you, I, I just want to read a couple of verses that God has spoken to us in His Word. In Romans, it says that, God showed his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. See, like I talked about earlier, I mess up. You mess up. And none of us are perfect. And that is sin. Sin is anything that we say, think, or do that is against what God has called us to be. And because of that sin, we are separated from God for eternity. God cannot be in the presence of sin. But God sent his only son to earth to live a perfect life to die a death on the cross that was so gruesome. And then God raised him from that grave so that you and I could be restored into relationship with God. And I just want to offer that to you. It's, it continues in Romans and it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Simply, you just have to call out to Christ and accept his payment for yourself and believe that in your heart. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. I hope that what I shared with you was encouraging. I hope that it, it brought some things to life that we need to start working on. As a church, as Christians, that we can be a church that is attractive for God's word. That we're attractive because of the gospel. And that we can take it out to a dying world and bring them in. I... I I'm just humbled that God has given me these opportunities. I'm humbled that He has allowed me to open His Word and, and help teach others. And my prayer for all of us is that we would do the same. You don't have to get on stage. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher, a small group leader to open God's Word and to help someone else live like Christ. It's, it's simple. Open it up. Do what it says and bring someone alongside of you. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope that you have a great rest of your week.